Wonderful to see everybody. We have a beautiful day outside and air conditioning inside, right? <laughs> no. When we're gathered together, we have voices to raise, uh, to praise the Lord. So let's just do that with joy in our hearts this morning, all right?
really, really important. So if you're not in a class, I'd love for you to consider the Thrive class, brand new class. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Now, speaking of classes, I wanted to recognize all of our teachers, all of the children's teachers and adult teachers, youth teachers. If you're a teacher, stand up so we can say thank you for all of your work. Good. All right. Now, if you are in We Worship or in Blast, stand up so we can see you. These are folks that keep you going. I'll tell you what. Okay, you may be seated. We need more than We Worship. Always. Always. One of the things that we want is young families here. we got to have to be able to take care of the youngins. So, uh, see Rochelle. Because we would love to have that in Blast. That is the uh, program that goes on during worship time for our elementary age kids. So it would be a great time to be a part. But I appreciate all of our teachers. We're looking forward to getting started again. It seems like it's been forever since we've had our classes going. So we're looking forward to it. And today, I want to uh, look at Connect with God's Word. Last week, we, we talked about Connect with God. This week's Connect with God's Word. Next week is going to be Connect with God's World. And um, those are the three purposes that we have in our church. And this is such an essential part of what we do as a church. Now, to illustrate that, I love Gar Gary Larson's Far Side Comics. Are you familiar with that? You guys like that? I mean, he, he just has this quirky sense of humor. So, uh, throw this up there, Brenda, see if you can see it real good. You see the fire going on, and the birds in the nest, and to get away from the fire, they put a rope down there, and they're climbing down the rope. And the, uh, the moniker at the bottom says, stupid birds. I love that because it sounds like stupid Christians sometimes. That's the way I was kind of thinking about it. Because sometimes what we do is, um, is what these birds seem to be doing. See, what makes it so comical is that these birds are working contrary to their nature and instinct. What would be their nature and instinct when a fire comes? Fly away. Exactly. I mean, that's what makes sense. But instead, they said, somebody said, let's get a rope and climb down and avoid this fire. Compare that with... Um, our problems that we have. Things that kind of burn up in our lives, our felt needs, if you will, and how we deal with them in strange ways, wrong ways, dumb ways. We haven't developed our faith instincts to a level that overtakes our natural instincts. When we have struggles in our lives, and who doesn't have struggles in our lives? Every one of you today, myself included, are going through or have gone through or will be going through tough times. And I, I would be the first to say that I would, I would wish that everything that I have in my life is a tough time. I will go and say, I'm going to handle this spiritually. Guess what? The natural rises up and just, I, I've got a rope and I'm trying to get down when I should be flying as God intended. So how do we develop our faith instincts? How do we develop them in greater fashion than our natural inclinations to do the wrong things? Well, very simple, but also very difficult. And that is, we need to have spiritual growth. Learning and developing our identity. See, one of the problems with those birds, somebody needs to come along and say, look guys, you're birds. You're supposed to fly. That's what birds do. One of the things about spiritual growth is that we learn who we are. You are God's children. You are supposed to be above those circumstances. You're supposed to not be dictated by those circumstances. You're supposed to grow in your faith and trust and walk. And we learn about who we are and how we then handle life's situations. Let's try to think of a simple definition for spiritual growth, and it's this. It's maybe the greatest, but the simple 
Becoming more like Jesus. That's what spiritual growth is. Becoming more like Jesus. I was thinking, of, in fact, I found a couple of passages in Philippians. We're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 1. If you want to turn there, that's where we're going to be most of the morning. But I love second chapter of Philippians. When uh, Paul is writing to the church, and he says, Do nothing out of self selfish ambition or conceit. Why does he write that? Because that's the natural inclination of our lives. But in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests. Why does he say that? Because that's our natural inclination but also the interests of others. And then he nails it down. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. And he says, you're going to have the mind of Christ in you. And to have the mind of Christ in you, you need to know what Christ did. That although he was rich, he became poor. Although he was a king, he became a pauper. Although he was in charge, he goes to the cross. Why? Because that's what God desired. And when we begin to understand spiritual growth, becoming more like Jesus, we've become convicted at our attitudes and our inclinations. And that's how we have to learn to grow differently. How does it happen? Well, it doesn't happen by someone waving a magic wand over you. Wouldn't it be great if uh, when you come to church next week, Mark met you? Uh, with a magic wand, he said, you are now spiritually mature. You are now spiritually mature. Woo, I'm feeling good. I'd love that. I would love that. It doesn't happen that way. It happens intentionally and in community where there is support, challenge, and accountability. Let me, let me read that again. I thought that, I, I wrote that pretty well. It happens intentionally. We decide to do that. And in community with others. Why? Because in community there's support, encouragement, challenge, and accountability. That's why we have these classes that we're going to have. Connection groups. To encourage you to grow as a believer in Jesus Christ. Or as a, a non-believer to be challenged in your non-beliefs. And how do you grow in that? A lot of times in Scripture, as we'll even see this morning, fruit is used as kind of a metaphor for your life. If there's no fruit, there's something wrong with the tree. There's no root. And that fruit is simply an authentication. It's a proof of life in the plant or the tree. Our uh, children are learning a, a verse when they get back to July 4th. And I love this verse, Philippians 1, 6. It says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's a great verse, a great verse of hope and a great verse of challenge as well. God started it, but it's not complete yet. He's saying that we're, we're in this, but we're not to this yet. He's going to carry it on. There's going to be things in your life that's going to challenge and change you into spiritual maturity. By the way, who's Paul speaking to? He's not speaking to an individual. He is speaking to the church. He's saying this is what's happening with you. I want you as a group of people to be challenged to know that you have Something that Christ has given you, but he's, going, he's not finished yet, and the work is going to just get started. So what I wanted to do this morning is look at this passage in 2 Peter, if you have that. 2 Peter chapter 1. We just finished this a few months ago in, uh, in our Wednesday night, but man, as I went back and started studying it once again, I was so impressed by what Peter has to say about our spiritual growth. What we need to do and how we need to do it and why we need to do it as well. Why don't you take part in it? What is your responsibility? So if you've got your Bibles there, 
I'll have it on the screen as well. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 is where we begin. Peter says, His divine power, we're speaking of God, His divine power, and then he has this incredible statement, has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. By these he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. Now I want you to start at the very beginning there. And if you underline things, you may want to underline some things this morning because it's an amazing thing, statement that he gives. He says what God does is he gives us his divine power. That's an amazing thing. God, in as the, as the creator, sustainer of this universe who is beyond our thought and imagination, through Jesus Christ, he implants within us those that believe and trust and receive him as Savior, a divine power. Not only that, it's not just kind of like, now I have the power. That's not it. The power is to overcome the spirit, the natural inclinations of our lives to become spiritually equipped and have fulfillment to live a life of godliness in this world, that this world does not overwhelm me, but instead, through Christ, I am an overcomer. Now, it sounds kind of passive. <clears throat> God pl implants His divine power, and then I wait around and for God to touch me and change me, and then I'm good. But then He mentions that we get this divine power through the knowledge of Him. Who is that? It's Jesus Christ, who has called us to himself. It's the one who has called us. How has he called us? He's called us through scripture, through the Old Testament. Time and time again, the reference to who Jesus is and what he wants and how he is going to come for us. And then, of course, as we have the New Testament and we see the life of Jesus Christ and his words to us and the words of all the apostles. In other words... God places his divine life within us, but its effectiveness, now get this, the word and the divine life is within us, but its effectiveness depends on the depth of our knowledge of what he has done for us and if we're leaning into the promises of God. I get that because I think that's something that we tend to gloss over. We all want to have that kind of spiritual wealth in our lives. We want to have a spiritual strength and maturity. We want to have the spiritual instincts to be able to overcome those things in our lives so that we don't act inappropriately or overwhelmed with life. God implants His divine life within us, but then it is essential that you and I work out what God has placed within us. In fact, look at this verse again from Philippians. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to do and work, or to will and to work according to his good purpose. I love that verse because it's both and. It's our passivity. God gives to us salvation. We don't earn it, we don't deserve it, but we receive it. But once we've received it, he said, now it's in you, work it out, get going. I don't know about you, but working out is not one of my very favorite things. Especially when it's about 84 degrees and about 90% humidity. You know what I'm talking about? We get outside and we, we, we walk or we jog or we do whatever. And we come back a sweaty mess. We say, why in the world did I do that? I was reading comics. I always read comics to get a sense of the world where we are. One of my favorites is Flo and Friends about senior citizens. I have no idea why I read that. But, <laughs> but today I was reading and, and uh, 
one, I think maybe Flo, I'm not sure, one of the one of the ladies whose son, whose middle-aged son, still lives at home and is kind of a ne'er-do-well and doesn't work very much. And she says, hey, and I think his name is Larry, wouldn't you know it? But anyway, hey, Larry, I'm going to start walking with the girls again outside. Why don't you join us? And he kind of, oh, I don't know. And then her granddaughter says, oh, he can't do it because he's in the fitness protection plan right now. <laughs> sometimes we feel that way naturally about our actually working out, and we sometimes feel that way about our spiritual life as well. Because I want to tell you something. In order to do anything working out, it takes effort on your part. And this means that you've got to stay long enough to be a part of a connection group. It's number one. But secondly, you need to be prepared when you go in there. And then number three, you need to stay awake long enough to be challenged. It's so easy for us to sit and just simply soak in and it doesn't do anything. But when the Word comes and it challenges you, that's when you begin to work out what God has worked in to your life. Let's keep going back in, in 2 Peter again, chapter 1, verse 5. For this very reason. Now, let me stop and just put a pause there for a second. For this very reason. You might say, well, look, God has given us a divine life and divine power to share in his divine life. This is a great thing for this very reason. You should rejoice. You should praise God. You should. That's not what he does. For this very reason, since God has done all this, Underline the next three words. Make every effort. You've got to really work hard at this. Make every effort to do what? To supplement your faith with goodness. <coughs> Excuse me. Goodness with knowledge. Knowledge with self-control. Self-control with endurance. Endurance with godliness. Godliness with brother affection. And brotherly affection with love. For this very reason, get to work. What are you supposed to do? Supplement. That means you have to contribute something. That means you have to be earnest and active in your spiritual formation of your life. It's not something you can just sit on Sunday morning and I'll speak to you and something magical happens. It doesn't happen that way. Hopefully some of the things that I say hit something, either good or bad. Sometimes people come out and say, you stepped on my toes today. And any time I've stepped on yours, I've stepped on all ten of mine at the same, before that, I've ever opened my mouth. Sometimes you would say, that really encouraged me. That, that's great. I don't want you not to just leave and not have any kind of change at all. But especially when you get into those connection groups and you say, now, I am ready to be challenged in my faith. I want to share what I know. And if somebody says, that is a great idea, or someone says, I've never heard it that way before, and they do it in a nice way, that's okay. You get challenged. You get encouraged. You get to learn something. But you've got to connect with God's Word. Now, how do you do that? Well, again, as I was studying this this week, I was um, challenged in my thinking about how we do spiritual formation, disciple making. How do we do that? A and I think Peter has something here that's eight qualities that we need to do, follow. So here, teachers, I had you all stand up a little bit ago. Teachers, here's my challenge to you. These eight qualities... Which of them are you going to emphasize each week? I want you to really, here's my challenge to you. We're going to meet a little later after, uh, after church. But here's my challenge to you. When you teach, why are you teaching what you are teaching? See, here's what we do as Baptists. We've, we've called it Sunday school for a long time, which is fine. And I'll still, you'll still hear me call it Sunday school. But we do Sunday school because... It's Sunday school hour. 
And so we go to our classes, and we read our quarterlies, and we leave. And that's it. I want to challenge you to ask the question, why in the world are you asking people to sit in your room with you? What are you wanting to get across and challenge in their lives? Because you are already challenged in your life in these areas. So let's look at them. Let me, let me give them to you. First one is faith. And as I, as I talk about faith, I want to say it's the foundational understanding of who you are in Christ. It is the things about Jesus Christ. It is sharing who He is. You can't have spiritual formation apart from having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So I hope that you are, as a teacher and as a student in those classes, you are saying, I want to make sure that my faith is the foundation. Also, how about goodness? And I looked at this. This is authentic, authenticity or an authentic living. It is moral goodness. One of the things that is a decry against the church, and it's true, is our hypocrisy. And um, we are that way. But I really don't know anybody who is not. But we sometimes live it, and we live it too unauthentically. I want us to be challenged in an authentic lifestyle that proclaims Jesus Christ, His goodness, and my neediness. And then there's knowledge. And I put beside this biblical worldview. It is what we probably do the best, and that is teaching God's Word. And we teach the, the truth, and I, I love that, but I want to say, how does it apply to our understanding of the issues of our day? And so there's a knowledge component. And you add to knowledge, self-control. Self-control, I would put spiritual disciplines that guide you and keep you moving forward. You know, it's, it's how you learn to control your emotions so your emotions don't control you. How do you do that? Well, that's the spiritual disciplines. Prayer, fasting, pr uh, reading the scriptures, worship, service, and, and a multitude of other things that we do. It's one of those things, if you want to be on a diet, right, you want to lose weight, you don't just get up one morning and say, I am now on a diet. I don't think you do that. You say, I'm going to buy different food. I'm not going to buy it, that big bag of potato chips this week. I'm not going to buy it. I'm going to walk outside for a half an hour today. I am going to avoid snack. You begin to make out a plan of disciplines in order to reach the goal that you want to reach. And self-control is to be able to live your life so that your life doesn't live you. There's, to add self-control is endurance. I want to tell you what, self-control takes endurance. The word is hupomeno, which means to bear under. It's not just simply grin and bear it, but it's to live missionally. This is how I was thinking sometimes we look at the Christian life as hanging. You've seen that picture of a cat hanging onto a, a, a bar and they're just hanging on. And that's somehow we think Christian life is. I'm just hanging on. That's not going to work. You've got to have something positive in your life. A purpose to live on mission. And that's how you endure. And then you add endurance. You add godliness. And that is a resembling of Jesus. And that is sharing the good news. Because that's exactly what Jesus came to do, to share the good news and glorify the name of Jesus, the name of God. And to add to godliness is affection. The word is phileo, which means brotherly love. And I take this to mean community. And I think it's great, and you should, be learning on your own. Absolutely. But I think there is great value in being in community with others. You do life with them in kindness, in generosity, and there might even be a person or two you find is difficult to get along with. And God said, I put them there for that reason. I want you to learn how to get along with others unlike yourselves. And the last one is add to affection, agape love. That's the word agape there which I put as sacrificial action. 
for others. You begin to say, what my life is about is to share my life and sacrifice for others. That's how you begin to grow. Now, teachers, what are you going to be emphasizing this week? You might even put it on a board, or you're going to say it in the class. But I want you to be intentional in your teaching. Students, as you are looking ahead that next week, what are you intentional about learning? What did you find out of the eight qualities of a disciple that really rung with you that week? Man, I think it would be a dynamic thing as we get together as a class together, as a group, as a connection group, that we connect in God's Word and we connect with one another and we begin to connect in a way that is a spiritual formation group. What are the benefits of connecting with God's Word? What are some of the dangers if you don't? Well, look at the next verse, verse 8, back to 2 Peter. For if you possess these qualities, in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Now, even though you have the divine life, right? We've already said that. You have the divine life within you. You still must Work. In fact, he says, if you possess these qualities, in what? What's the next word? Increasing measures. When you increase, you're getting bigger. You know that when your clothes don't fit, you're increasing in the wrong way, you know? But he's saying, I want you to increase in the right way, and I want you to increase your spiritual formation. In other words, you never stop learning. I'm getting up older in years. The more that I gain in years, the more I understand, I understand less and need to understand more. There is a never-ending process in learning and application. And if you, you still have to work. I don't care where you are. There is no one here that is so spiritual in your attainment that you said, I don't think I need anything else. I think if I show up uh, occasionally, I will be, I'm just topping off the tank. That's all. No. This world <clears throat> empties your tank daily sometimes. And the struggle is, how do I, in the midst of a fire, fly the way I'm supposed to, or will I do that natural inclination? You need an increasing measure. I am preaching to myself this morning. If you don't, you're going to be useless or unfruitful. Did you get that? Do you remember the time that Jesus with his disciples were going by and there was a tree that did not bear any fruit? It had leaves. It looked nice, but it didn't bear any fruit. Remember what Jesus did? It's a very fascinating thing. We won't have time to go into it, but he curses the tree. And he says, that's it. You don't bear any fruit. You will not bear any fruit. I mean, I, I believe that Jesus is far more concerned about your spiritual formation than you and I are. And he's saying, go, do this thing. This is incredibly important. If we don't, we just simply lose what God has done in our minds through Jesus Christ. He said, if, if you don't do this, the person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted. And it was interesting there. It's kind of odd to say blind and short-sighted. Shouldn't be short-sighted and blind. But what he's saying is the blind is probably someone who's closed their eyes. You remember back in those younger days when you were scared? I still do this when I watch. I don't like scary movies. I just don't like scary movies. If I see something, my heart's starting to race, I close my eyes. Do you ever do that as a kid? Maybe you still do it today. You just close, because if you close your eyes, you don't see it, it's not going to happen, right? And he's saying the blind is the one who has literally closed their eyes to what is important, or you're short-sighted, which is what I am. And if I take these off, 
you just become blurs to me. Because I am nearsighted, short-sighted. I need something to correct my vision. And we've got the Holy Spirit and the direction of Scripture that will correct our lives. Or we become blind or nearsighted to what Jesus has done for us. Let's close it out. Verse 10. Therefore, after all this, all the stuff before is there for this reason. Therefore, brothers and sisters, and here's that phrase again. You ought to underline it one more time. Make every effort to confirm your calling and election because if you do these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, entering into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided for you. Now, once again, I want you to look at that. Make every effort, sincere effort, unexhausted effort, something that is not just attempted and aborted, but something that you keep going. And as you keep going, you are calling to mind the goodness of God, and we believe Him even more. We grow in our connection with others, and you're confirming that you believe as others believe, and we can stand together. In fact, he says you won't stumble. Now, he doesn't say you won't fail. He says you won't fall. We're going to be able to walk together. And one of the beautiful things about a Connect group, I know several of our groups have done this in the past. When someone is really struggling, maybe it's a health concern, maybe it's a loss of life, maybe it's a question about income, Others come around and they strengthen that one through words, through helps, through prayers. And he says that as you continue on and you get to the final entrance of life, you're going to enter that life with richness, with joy, with something to look forward to. I, I recall I shared with you that Back in my younger days, I, I did many marathons, uh, 13 point something miles. And, and uh, I remember the very first one that I did. It was on a day like today. It was hot. It was muggy. I had, I had trained. I had worked hard. But about the eighth or ninth mile, I said, why did I do this? This was dumb. And I had to walk. And I had to juggle. And I had to walk a little bit more. I juggled a little less. And I had to walk. When I got to the finish line, they took pictures, and I wish, I have no idea where my picture is after our move. It's somewhere in the nether regions, but they, they take a picture. I bought that picture, and here I am running, and I finished the finish line like this. I did head down, and I just barely, just barely getting across. But when I got back home, I made a commitment to be better prepared the next year. So I ran more, I ran harder, I lost more weight, and I, I got going. And that second year, when I crossed the finish line, it was something I said, I know they're going to take my picture. I'm going to look up. <laughs> and I'm going to smile because I am finishing the race. I didn't have to stop. I didn't have to walk. Why? Because I recognized that was what I needed to do in order to do the race. And the struggle that we have in our lives, sometimes when we feel that, that downward, I can barely finish the line, it's when others come around in those connection groups and they say, we know what you mean. We've been there. We are there. Let's do this together. Let's struggle together. Now let me close out with three thoughts. <clears throat> Every Christian needs a purpose. Your purpose is not just to get to heaven. That's your final place. But your purpose is to glorify God through Jesus Christ. And you need to spell that out. You need to, when you get to that connection group, don't just say, I'm here. But why are you here? Teacher, I'm glad you're here. But why are you glad they're here? What is your purpose today? What is your purpose over the next six weeks? What do you want to see accomplished in the lives? You have them in your hands. It's not just to impart knowledge. It's to give them purpose and meaning and hope and direction. 
and all those eight qualities. Every Christian needs a purpose because that's what keeps us going when the fire is right there in our lives. Every Christian needs a plan. You need a plan. I'm, I'm a kind of a plan guy in my own life. I, I know what I'm going to be doing about every day. And, and, and it's, it's really important that I do those things because it builds things into my life. And when I don't do them, and they're disrupted, and, and they, that's, that's happening, it changes things. I lose things. You need a plan. What is your plan? What is your plan? If it, if it doesn't involve connection groups, okay, fine. What, where are you going to get your challenge? Where are you going to get your in-depth study? What does it mean? And how will you get there? What do you want? What's your plan? And the third thought is this. Every Christian needs other people pursuing God's will. I really believe that. We are not saved to be monks. In a, in a monastery all by ourselves. We are, we are saved to be in community with other people. That's why, man, I, I love when Derek and the worship team leads in worship because, and I, I'm standing up front, you were singing so well this morning. I love to hear that because that is other people pursuing God. Other people proclaiming the goodness of God. And there is an encouragement to that. There is a strengthening to do that. It's not just what you've got. It's what you've got and share and others share into your life. There is an in and out. You are blessed in order to be a blessing. Your life should be a conduit of what you've learned and how you've grown and how you've been blessed and how you share that. And you don't do that any better than in a group of people. Jesus is the one who set this in motion. Because of all people, Jesus did not need a community. You understand that, right? Jesus didn't need his disciples. But he chose them. And he chose to work through them. And he continues to work through those disciples. A Unibaptist church. What would happen if you began to examine your purpose, plan, and said, you know, I, I need to grow in my spiritual life. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'd love for you to examine that this week. Would you? Let's stand together. We'll dismiss in prayer. In a few weeks, we're going to have opportunity to have a response physically to the end of the sermon. We're getting there. July 4th, we're going to do it. But I'm asking you to commit today where you are to asking God, how do you want me to grow? Show me the way. Father, I thank you for this time. You challenge us and you continue to challenge us. There's no end in your challenges. We want to be your people. That's who we are. And yet, sometimes, we're putting a rope down. when we should be flying to you. God, would we be the kinds of people on mission, on growth for you today. That's our prayer. That you would find us growing when you come. In Jesus' name I pray. You are.